Bob about his tendency to get mad at people when they didn't please him. And I will take care of that issue with him. That is Bob's life. It is not yours. Your responsibility is for your own choices. You are responsible for your own decisions. And Bob is going to be responsible for how he responded to you. That will be his problem, not yours. But the fact that you chose to give in to him is your problem. And now I want to show you, if we will take a few minutes to do so, what your life could have been like had you not given up that opportunity to talk to Bob when I wanted you to do so. If you'll just direct your attention to the screen over here, let me show you what your life could have been and how it would have worked out for you. Then you can see what it had been like if you had stopped pleasing men and started to please me, God says. We have a hard time in life trying to do what God wants us to do. And we are overly interested in pleasing people instead of pleasing God. Uh, a pastor by the name of Justin Buzzard, <laughs> what a great name for a pastor, uh, wrote this. What is your greatest fear? And what does that say about what you really worship? Pastor Justin Buzzard uh, uses the following assessment tool to determine which idols are lurking in our hearts. The first one is control. He says, you know that you have a control idol if your greatest nightmare is uncertainty. Approval is the next. You know that you have an approval idol if your greatest nightmare is rejection. Comfort then. You know that you have a comfort idol if your greatest nightmare is stress or demands. And finally, power. You know you have a power idol if your greatest nightmare is humiliation or embarrassment. And that's where he ends his assessment for us this morning. I'm bringing these things up because there's some things that we need to talk about from this passage this morning. People pleasing pulls us away from what God wants us to be and what God wants us to do. And it can be a friend that pulls you away. It can be an enemy that pulls you away. It can be a family member. And that's usually where it's the toughest who pulls you away from your devotion to Christ and pleasing him. We would rather face the rejection of God apparently than we would the rejection of man. This is a real problem with a host of today's preachers as well. They are bent on tickling the ears of their audience, just like it was predicted in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, that in the last days, the people of the church will gather, the people of the world in the church will gather people that they want to hear from, people that will say what they want to hear, instead of preaching the truth of God, as it stands written in the text. Today we will meet some professors of the law of God in the Old Testament who diligently study the scriptures but who want to please their colleagues and look good to them in such a complete manner, in such a complete way that they completely miss who Jesus Christ is. Now understand what I just said. These are people who study the word of God every single day. In the Old Testament days, most of the teachers of the law had it memorized. It was much easier than opening a scroll and finding the one that you needed. They would memorize the entire word of God. They knew the word of God. They knew the prophecies of Messiah, and yet they completely missed who Jesus Christ really was when he was standing right in front of them. Why? Because they were jealous of him, they were envious of him, and they were more intent on pleasing and looking good to their friends, their colleagues, than they were to the Son of the living God the Messiah. And today there are many churches and church people who are reading the Bible and who have never found Jesus, the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And the reason they have never found him is because they don't really listen to the text. Let's now go to John chapter 5, verses 31 to 47 in your copy of the Word of God. There's a lot of uh, scattered thoughts in this particular passage that are all woven together. We're going to handle most of them in, in an individual fashion and see how they fit together. So I'm reading from John chapter 5, and I want to read verses 31 down through the end of that passage. And here's what it says if you'll follow along. Jesus is still trying to prove to people who he is, and he still wants them to understand that they're missing who he is. And so here's what he says. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. 
There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Now, of course, that's John the Baptist, don't forget. But the testimony which I receive is not that from men, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He, that is John the Baptist, was the lamp that was burning and shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, their very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Now that's a, that's a mouthful to say to a group of people who hear the word of God every day. That's their life. That's what they do. That's what the teachers of the law are always involved in. And Jesus has the audacity to say, the Father who sent me testifies of me in the very law that you're reading and memorizing, and you have never heard the voice of the Father. You do not, going on in verse 38, you do not have his word abiding in you. What does he mean? The word is in their heart. They can, they can spew it out at any moment. They've, they've got it there. They can use it. And Jesus is saying, no, it's not really in your heart. It might be in your mind, but it's not in your heart. It's not abiding in you. For you do not believe him who sent me. So apparently people can know the word of God and miss Jesus Christ. You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, verse 40. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do you think that I will accuse you before the Father? The one who accuses you is Moses. Now, that's the law that they know frontwards and backwards, inside and out, and they have it memorized. And they say, he is saying the one who wrote that book is going to be the one who testifies against you before you end up in hell. He goes on to say, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And the answer is they won't if they don't believe the writings of Moses, the one that they pretend to follow. Now, we need to look at verses 31 and 32 together. This is where Jesus is still trying to testify about the fact that he is the son of the living God. And we learn there that it is God the Father who, who is testifying to the truth about Jesus and not Jesus himself. He wants them to understand the Father in heaven is the one who is testifying about who I am and what I am. And he says, I'm not really the one that's even doing that. And ultimately, it comes from the Father. Now, we're still in this context of Jesus being confronted by Jewish leaders, and their goal is to put him to death. You can see that in verse 18 of John 5. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. And they've even admitted that they want to kill him. He knows they want to put him to death, and he's still trying to defend for them who he really is. What we have here today is part of his defense for that. There are two main understandings that scholars have on these two verses. Some believe that Jesus means that his sole testimony of himself would be inadmissible in a Jewish court among the elders because it would violate Deuteronomy 19.15. In Deuteronomy 19.15, it says, let every fact be established on the evidence of two or three witnesses. And he means eyewitnesses. So some people think, well, Jesus is saying if I testify of myself, I don't have anybody else testifying. I don't have two or three, and therefore my testimony would be inadmissible. That's what some people think. So if Jesus says, uh, I, I testify about myself alone, then my testimony would not be true. But the point is he does not testify by himself. It is also a statement about the false messiahs that have testified about themselves, like that's in verse 43. I come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me, if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Jesus wants to know, why is it everybody comes along and claims something, you fall head over heels for him, I come and I give you evidence and I tell you the truth, and you don't believe me. 
Secondly, some scholars believe that all Jesus is saying is that his testimony is not from himself, not that he can't testify of himself, but that it is from the Father. And as such, it is infinitely valuable. He is not the one who is doing it ultimately. He is not doing it on his own accord ultimately, but he is doing what the Father told him to do and saying what the Father told him to say. What he says in verse 31 is then uh, different from the claim he makes in chapter 8, 14, where he says, I testify of myself, but it's a different context. He, he words it differently, and if you take the second way that scholars understand this text, there is no contradiction. It's okay for Jesus to testify who he is and say, this is who I am, but he wants you to know here, this didn't come from me, it came from the Father. So it all boils down to this. If you're having trouble believing Jesus is the Son of God, if you're having trouble believing that Jesus is the Savior of the world, he wants you to know the Father in heaven, which, by the way, the Jews all believe in, is the one who really testifies about me. And if you don't believe me, you don't believe him. If you believe him, you believe me. And that's where he wants his people to be. The Bible tells us that Jesus only spoke on earth what the Father told him to speak. We can be sure that what he says about himself is exactly what the Father's testimony of Jesus is. In John chapter 3, verse 34, Jesus says, What I hear from the Father, that's what I tell you. So his testimony is true because it comes from the Father. The Father witnesses to the truth about Jesus, and Jesus also witnesses, both eyewitnesses, both meet Deuteronomy 19.15 and that validation there. Then he talks a little bit about the witness of John the Baptist in verses 33 and 34. Jesus knows that they sent a delegation to John the Baptist to find out what the truth was. And when they went in John chapter 1, they said, hey, are you the Messiah? John says, I'm not the Messiah. Are you the prophet that Moses said was coming? He said, I'm not the, I'm not the prophet. I'm just one who is crying in the wilderness to make ready the way of the true prophet, of the true Messiah. That's who I am, and that's who you're looking for. We learn here that the believer's testimony is valid. John's testimony is valid. It's just not what Jesus relies upon for who he is. Jesus relies on the Father. John the Baptist testified what the Father told him to say about Jesus. Jesus is who he says he is. And that truth comes from the Father, and there is no higher witness than God. And he got that witness to John the Baptist, and he got that witness to Jesus Christ and to the Holy Spirit and to the believers on earth of who he was. And they listened, and they became believers. However, there are others who testify about him, like the man the religious leaders sent to John to find out who he was. John admitted his ministerial call, but clearly put to rest any notion that he might be the Messiah. John was a witness for the Messiah, and he pointed people to Jesus, the one who was coming after him. The Father's goal in sending John was that the people would trust John's testimony and that they would come to faith in Christ. John was not the light but a lamp that burned brightly and, in fact, temporarily, the people rejoiced in the light that he shined. Now, I believe that there is an Old Testament passage that prophesies about John the Baptist and the light. And if you want to turn there with me uh, to Psalm 132, I want to read in the middle of that prophecy what I believe and others believe is about John the Baptist and what he would do. I want to start in verse 16. It says, her priests, speaking of Israel's priests, also I will clothe with salvation, and her godly ones will sing aloud for joy. There I will cause the horn of David to spring forth. That would be the ruler of David. That would be Jesus. I have prepared a lamp for mine anointed. I prepared a lamp for mine anointed. I think he's talking about John the Baptist, who claimed to be uh, the lamp that would light the way for the Messiah, the true light of the world. But as we know it from the New Testament, the people as a whole did not respond to John's witness the way they should have as a nation and repented of their sins. It is always dangerous not to accept the faithful witnesses of the people that God appoints to witness to his word. Let's move on to verse 36, witnesses of work. So we've talked about God witnessing to who Jesus Christ is. We've talked about John the Baptist also witnessing to the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Jesus says there's yet another testimony in verse 36. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. The works which the Father has given me to accomplish the very works that I do testify about me 
that the Father has sent me. So the Father says he's the real things. Jesus is joining in that, obviously. John the Baptist said he's the real things. And the works that he does also testify that he is who he says he is. And he's doing what God told him to do. We learn there that even a greater witness than John are the works that Jesus performed from the Father. Have you ever noticed that the great man, John the Baptist, one of the greatest prophets that ever lived on planet Earth, who gave up his life for the testimony that he gave to Jesus Christ, who walked the same roads that Jesus walked, whose whole life was about him, never did one single powerful, miraculous miracle. Not one. Never. If you look at John 10, 41, it says, Many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Isn't that amazing? That one of the greatest witnesses that ever walked planet Earth about King Jesus was a man who merely spoke what God told him to speak. Never did a, a miraculous sign miracle. Never did anything miraculous. Not one sign. And yet they say everything he said about this man is true. Jesus comes along and he does all kinds of signs, all kinds of miracles that can only come from the living God. And they don't believe him. Jesus did great and miraculous things by the power of God. This, along with his sterling character, was a greater witness than John was to his deity. Jesus told the truth and witnessed to his authority and power by his mighty deeds. It says that in John 21, 25. We, of course, understand that the enemy also does miracles too, and we're cautious because it says in Matthew 24, 24, that the Antichrist and the beast are going to do these powerful miracles, and it's going to be that even the elect are going to start to doubt and think they might be the real thing when they're not. So we know the enemy has things that they can do that is great and miraculous and powerful, but they didn't do anything like Jesus could do. And they didn't do the things that Jesus did. But we're cautious. We don't get carried away in the emotion of a religious moment just because we see something that looks to be spectacular and miraculous. No, we test it because we don't want to be deceived. But if you test Jesus Christ, there's no deception. Everything he says is true. Jesus told the truth and witnessed to his authority by great power. Jesus fulfilled prophecies about him from the Old Testament, like in Isaiah 35, 5 through 6, and many, many, many others that he did exactly as he should have done. What a person does must be congruent with what the person says. What a person does must be in line with what a person says. Years ago, Major Ospovich, an Air Force pilot for the former USSR, planned that day to give a talk at his children's school, and his talk was going to be about peace. But he would need time off during the day to give his talk at the school, so he volunteered for night duty. And that's how Major Ospovich found himself patrolling the skies over the eastern regions of the Soviet Union, on September the 1st, 1983. That was the night that Korean Airlines flight KE-007 strayed innocently into Soviet airspace. Soon the Soviet pilot, Major Ostrovich, was caught in a series of blunders and misinformation. In the end, Major Ostrovich followed orders that he was given and he shot down the unidentified aircraft the actions of an Air Force major who was preparing to talk about peace plummeted 240 passengers to their deaths and sparked an international incident that pushed world powers to a standoff. Our talk is important, but our actions carry more weight. What a person does must be congruent with what a person says. And I'm going to drag that into the next section, and we're going to talk about how that also needs to be us. Jesus, what he said, perfectly matched what he did. I just wonder, what you say on Sundays, in Sunday school class, what you think in church, what you say to people at potlucks, what you say at Bible study, does that match what you do Monday morning? According to the studies they've done on the church, they say it doesn't. They say that we don't live any different than the, differently than the world 
throughout the week. That should not be said of us. Verses 37 to 38. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. And you have not heard his voice at any time, nor have you seen his form. By the way, Jesus has heard and he has seen. You do not have his word abiding in you because you don't believe that he sent me. The opponents of Jesus, though religious, are not born-again believers. Did you know you could be religious and not be born again? Did you know you could know the word of God and not know Jesus? Did you know that you can say the right things and do the right prayers so that others marvel at your spirituality and you don't have any? Jesus levels three accusations against the religious leaders of his day. Number one, they do not hear the voice of Jesus. Not at all. I want to read to you something from Fortune magazine that was written in January. It's called Hearing the Voice of God. This is not a believer saying this, but it says in Fortune magazine, so long as the church pretends or assumes to preach absolute values, but actually preaches relative and secondary values, it will merely hasten the process of disintegration, the mean of the church. We are asked to turn to the church for our enlightenment, but when we do so, we find that the voice of the church is not inspired. The voice of the church today, we find, is the echo of our own voices. When we consult the church, we hear only what we ourselves have said. There is only one way out of this spiral, and the way out is the sound of a voice. Not our voice, but the voice coming from something beyond ourselves in the existence of which we cannot disbelieve. It is the duty, <clears throat> excuse me, it is the duty of the pastors to hear his voice and to cause us to hear it and to tell us what it says. Does that sound like the church today in America? I forgot to mention, this came out of Fortune magazine, January 1940. Where are we today? Secondly, he says against the, his opponent, they have not seen God. Thirdly, he says, they do not have his word abiding in their hearts. Apparently, you can study God's word and yet not know him. We must be guided in life by the word which abides within, which is implanted on our hearts, James says. And we need to listen to that word and let it get into our life. And Jesus said, you haven't heard the Father. You haven't seen the Father's form. And then he talks about the fact that the word of God is not in them. Wait a minute. They can, you pick a verse. Ask him what it says in Psalm 13.3. They've got it. Ask him what Genesis chapter 49 is about. They can rattle it off but they've never heard God, they've never seen God, and it's not in their hearts. You can have Bible study every day. You can pray every day and not know who Jesus Christ is. You can walk the walk in front of other people, but in reality it's not there because you haven't heard, you have not seen, and it does not abide in you. The word of God cannot be in the heart of those who don't believe him. It cannot be. The last section, 39 to 47. And this is really where I drew from our introduction and what we want to camp on just a little bit and apply to ourselves. And the Father who, I'm sorry, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. You want to find eternal life in the Old Testament? Find Jesus there. He says it's there. It's what Moses talked about. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. You think you have it, but you don't. And then he says, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. See, if I have the love of God in me, I'm going to seek the glory of God. I'm not going to care what men think. He says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Then he says, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that is from 
the one and only God. See, I think there has to be, in everyone's life who comes to Christ, a time when they snip away all the emotional connections and what other people think about them and say, I don't care what you think. I don't care what, where you think I'm going, but I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to make him number one in my life. I'm not going to care anymore what you think about my Jesus or what you think about me. Call me a Jesus freak if you want to. Call me a nut. Call me crazy. But that doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is what matters to God. And that's where Jesus is trying to take you. See, if I'm focusing on what people want and what people think as a pastor, I probably don't know Jesus. I'm certainly not going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to placate you in your sin. I'm going to say, that's okay. Everybody's a sinner. Don't worry about it. You don't have to get right with God. God just wants to make you rich and healthy and wealthy and have a happy life. That's all he cares about. There is no hell. There is no judgment. Everybody gets to go. And that's the message of the church today. Not here. The religious leaders thought they could keep the law and be saved. In fact, one of their famous rabbis, Rabbi Hillel, is quoted by Dr. Carson saying this, Hillel affirms that the more study of the law, the more life. And if a man gains for himself the words of the law, he has gained for himself the words of life to come. That's Hillel. He's wrong. These men did study the word, but they never met God. The Old Testament is about Christ. Moses, the one that they venerate, wrote about, prophesied about, and promised the coming of Christ. Strange to think, isn't it, that these Jews are going to use the law that is about Jesus Christ, use the law that he wrote, through the prophet Moses to be the reason they want to put him to death. This is jumping ahead, but what it says in John 19, 7 is that the Jews answered him, we have a law, and by that law, he ought to die. How messed up can you get? So that's what happens when people who don't know Jesus Christ have the word of God in their mouth. It makes no sense. They readily receive false messiahs. But when the one comes who Moses spoke about, they don't get it. Why do they reject him? Why can't they see? Verse 44 is a partial answer. Partial. He says, how can you believe? When you're all about the glory of your compadres, your peers, the people that dwell in the circles you dwell in, and you do not seek the glory that is from God. See, you can't please people and at the same time please God. Jesus was not the flavor of the day in his time. The religious leaders wanted the praise of their colleagues more than they wanted the praise of God. What are you willing to sacrifice so that the people at work like you and want to be around you and invite you to their parties what are you willing to give up in your commitment to Jesus Christ to be a part of the fun group that got all puffed up about themselves and they could not see the truth that only God is great? In 1717, King Louis XIV of France died. Preferring to be called Louis the Great, he was the monarch who declared, I am the state. His court was the most magnificent in Europe, and his funeral was most spectacular. In the church where the ceremony was performed, his body laid in a gold coffin, according to his orders and his wishes. And the church, the cathedral, was dimly lit, except for one big candle above his gold coffin. He wanted it to be something that shined out for all to see in the cathedral, so that they would focus on his greatness even in death. He had given orders that that's the way it should be. The thousands of people who attended waited in silence as Bishop Massillon began to speak. Slowly reaching down, he snuffed out the candle and he said, only God is great. Only God is great. I think that must have taken guts to do that. I don't know what it cost him, but he did it. Only God is great. 
They sought his death because they were jealous of him. Matthew 27, 18. They fought his death. They, they fought his death. They fought for his death because they wanted to please their colleagues and not appear stupid like they don't know the word of God by siding with this Messiah. Did you know that wanting to please people keeps people out of the kingdom of God like it did them? People don't want to be known as religious nuts, do they? They don't want their friends to shun them and not invite them to their parties and make them a part of their inside stories and jokes. And they don't want to be left out and lonely. They want to be popular with people. And if you choose popularity with people, you choose against popularity with God. They chose, excuse me, get this over with, sorry. They chose popularity despite hell. They chose popularity despite hell. Since Moses wrote about Jesus and since the Jews reject Jesus, it is true that the religious leaders do not really believe what Moses wrote. Apparently, if we tell somebody we believe the word of God and yet we don't believe Jesus, then we're liars and the truth is not in us. Let's think about some ways we can apply this to ourselves because we obviously need to. I want to ask you this question. This is number one in your bulletin there. Ask yourself this question. Are you seeking the glory of God or men? Now, right away, we'd hold up our hands and say, no, I'm all about the glory of God. Are you? Really? Is that how you make your decisions? What you're going to do, where you're going to be, what you're going to say, how you're going to act in your business, and how you're going to carry on in the world? Is that really you? Do you fear God or do you fear men? Someone wrote a letter to the fear of what others think. And it says this, I am sick of you. And it's time we broke up. I know we've broken up and gotten back together many times, but I am serious today. Fear of what others think. This is it. We're breaking up. I'm tired of overthinking my status updates on Facebook trying to sound more clever, funny, and important. I am sick of feeling anxious about what I say or do in public, especially around people I don't know that well, all in the hope that they'll like me, accept me, praise me. I run around all day feeling like a golden retriever with a full bladder. Like me, like me, like me. Because of you, I go through my day with a cloud of shame hanging over my head, and I never stop acting. The spotlight is always on. I am the center stage. I, I'd better keep dancing, posturing, mugging, or else the spotlight will move and I'll dissolve into a little meaningless puddle on the ground, just like that witch, is in the, that witch in The Wizard of Oz. I can never live up to the expectations of my imaginary audience, the one that lives only in my head but whose collective voice is louder than any other voice in the universe. And all of this is especially evil because... I really, if I really stop and think about it and let things go quiet and listen patiently for the voice of God who made me and the Savior who died for me in his eyes, it turns out I'm actually profoundly precious, lovable, worthy, valuable, and even just a little ghetto fabulous. When I find my true identity in Christ, then... You turn back into the tiny, yapping little dog that you were before. So eat it, fear of what others think, for you and I are done. And no, I'm not interested in talking it through. I'm running, jumping, laughing you out of my life once and for all. Or at least that's what I really, really want God to help me to do. Are you here this morning you need to break up with the fear of what others think? Secondly, the Pharisees sought human praise. John 12, 43 is worth looking at in this context. It says, for they love the approval, you see that? The glory of men rather than the glory of God. Whose glory is most important to you? The Pharisees sought human praise. Learn this. People choose groups whose praise 
matter to them. You choose the group whose praise matters to you. The Pharisees like Pharisees because they're, they're all intellectuals. And they like to be intellectual. They like to not be like the little people. Did you know in Jesus' day, Herod had built a ramp for them, a great big giant huge ramp that they could walk straight across where the little people live <laughs> and the everyday person, the dirty people, so they could go right across from there to the palaces that they lived in and not have to rub the shoulders of the people Jesus came to die for. They would have bypassed your home and mine. They seek the glory of the people that matter the most to them. Who matters the most to you? Does God's praise of you matter? If that's true, you've got to think ahead. You've got to think ahead. Because judgment day is coming. How do you want that to turn out? You've got to do today what is going to make it good for you then. Are you, are you spiritually in tune enough to see that? That what you do today matters on that day. I believe you are. Does God's praise matter to you? Could I ask how much? Dr. Vodi Bakken said this. You must lose the temptation to compromise in order to impress. You must lose the temptation to compromise in order to impress. Now, I say this, not him. It matters who you're trying to impress. And if it's people, we will compromise. Another theologian said, how much of your love for Jesus are you prepared to give up in order to alleviate suffering or the loss of worldly friends? How much of your love for Jesus are you prepared to give up in order to alleviate suffering or the loss of friends? And finally this. These folks agonized over Scripture and still they manage to miss Jesus. Just because you read the word of God does not mean you know, or does not know, mean that you know, excuse me. Let me try that again. As Greg Hoban would say, I can do better than that. Just because you know the word of God does not mean you know the God who wrote it. These folks agonized over scripture and still managed to miss their Messiah. Many church leaders today do the same thing. Don't be like them. Does the truth of Jesus emanate from your heart or is it coming from your head? Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, it is my prayer for each of us that we would desire the glory of God in our life, not glory from men. That means we may have to change some of the things we're doing in our life and the way we're living and why we make the decisions that we make because sometimes we do them just to please people, to look good in their eyes, and at the same time we sacrifice our love for you on the altar of selfishness and ego and pride. It's enough that it kept these men in this text from missing their only ticket to heaven. And we don't want to be like that. So I pray that you would give us the courage and the strength and the wherewithal through the power of the Spirit of God to not just know the word, but to hear it, to do it, and to know personally the one who wrote it. God, give us strength in these days when the voice from the church has not been yours, but has been the sound of the pleasing of men. God, forgive the church in America and help us to speak the truth. And I ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. <coughs>